The dog has a brain and a central nervous system. The plant does not. If I had both here, <laughs> I was not brought here for my dancing, so that's not going to be any good. <laughs> hey everyone. So I was recently invited to speak at a local humanist group about veganism and animal rights. My favorite part of the evening was after I did my talk, they fired questions at me for close to two hours. Now as you're watching, if you like what you're seeing, please consider hitting that subscribe button because I'm about to hit 500 subscribers, which is a pretty big deal to me and I really appreciate all the support. Now I'm going to break the Q&A into two parts, um, both above and in the video description if you want to check out the other part. If you're short on time, also check out the video description where you can jump straight to the topic that might be of most interest to you. Now if you're curious to see the talk I did before this q and I'll link that as well, uh, above, below, wherever I can. Now bear in mind that this was recorded in a Mexican restaurant, so the audio and video um, isn't ideal, but I think the content more than makes up for this. With that, let's get into it. Did anybody have any burning questions? Should we just jump straight into it? And I yeah, guess before yeah. we start, do we have any hard stops on the venue or? We normally go on the 9.30, but you know, it's up to everybody. Uh, I live for this stuff, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> happy to be here as long as you guys are happy to have me, so. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks for your talk. Um, you mentioned um, essential vitamin B12 deficiency earlier on, and I'm more interested on the nutritional point of view as well. So how do you ensure that you have adequate vitamin B12 as well as calcium, iron, and zinc? Yeah, good questions. I mean, I think, um, as I qualified earlier, I'm not a dietitian. However, I do work with a team of registered dietitians. There's a free support program called Challenge 22 that if you sign up to that, you can ask them any question that's specific to you and they'll give you a, a professional dietitian response. The way I personally address it is B12 is the only um, thing that needs to be supplemented um, for a myriad of reasons outside of just um, through animal use. So I take, um, so you just take a towel, towel. Yeah, I take a daily supplement yeah. from the Vegan Society. It's I think it works out to like one or two P a day. It's, it's not going to break the bank. Um, they're flavored and there's some other things. I think it has um, vitamin D, I think vitamin C. I, think, I want to say it has zinc in it as well. So it actually is hitting a few of those things that aren't necessary, but it's kind of a bonus. Well, I think, what's, what's the problem with Marmite? I just had Marmite bar, bar right last night, so hopefully nothing. <laughs> I just wonder why you take a tablet when you can't take something. Oh, I see, like, for, like um, fortified oh, foods versus... <sighs> my, 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 my understanding of it is that fortified foods have very trace amounts, as well as they're not necessarily a consistent source. Um, and the thing with um, B12 absorption, I think it's like 25 um, micrograms that we need each day, so to consistently get that amount, um, I think it's harder to track when we try to get it through our foods um, versus just taking a supplement and knowing we're covered. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically just a way to be safe because I think most of us will agree B12 deficiency is pretty serious, especially in later stages, so it's just kind of why not take a supplement. Isn't B12 present in, it's essentially, it's dirt, isn't it? Bacteria that typically is yeah, found it's, in dirt? It's, it's, yeah. it's not, it's not because we now have our, 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 our vegetables so sanitized and cleaned that actually that's where we're missing out our B12. And if you buy you know, certain down in East Wichita where you've got parsnips that come out of the ground and they're covered in dirt, some of that dirt is going to get into your food and that's enough B12. Yeah, the same for the water supply as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, and that's where the B, that's where, well, I suppose natural enemies get it themselves, which is easy. Mm -hmm. No, they make it. That's the and they make it. Mm -hmm. You say, what, what's that the... Wait a minute, no, I'm... I'm... <laughs> <laughs> You're making it up. Yeah. Be bees make bee trials, is what you're saying. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Especially if there's a bunch of them, they're called B12. Um... I can see. <laughs> Lick yeah, definitely. Lick dirt. Thank you. Lick dirt, yeah, yeah. Lick dirt. yeah, yeah. Don't you know. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, B12 absorption is pretty serious, though. I know my partner um, went to the doctor and realized, I don't know if anybody's heard of homocysteine, but if you have that tested, that can indicate your B ability to absorb B12. And my partner actually, she just gets a jab um, uh, every three months or so to just top up her levels because that's more absorbable than the tablets. Um, and you heard my story. Uh, I was vegan about 40 years ago, for about three and a half years, and I stopped because I um, got B12 deficiency. Like tingling fingers, yeah. Like, you've got a good stock, but eventually it runs out. Mm -hmm. and, 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 
it's interesting, I just um, uh, interacted with someone who had a B12 deficiency that wasn't vegan, um, that, um, which I think just to, to me underscored that it's, yeah, it's good for all of us to be mindful of and hopefully if we're thinking about these things because of veganism, it could actually be a benefit and help us to prevent some of these issues and not necessarily be a, a barrier. Any other? Yes. It's a rather complicated question. Uh, Those are my favorite. <laughs> uh, because you're talking about the morality of veganism, mm -hmm. does it mean that vegans are nicer people than non-vegans? Yes. No. <laughs> Good because, question. Because in a way, you could say it makes you more right thinking in your relationships with animals, etc. Does that translate then to better relationships with with humans? Not always. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing to re remember is we're all people, we're all humans. Um, I like to think that it's certainly for me, um, increased my respect for everyone. Um, and I guess another related thing is I think vegans um, can be um, criticized as being um, uh, coming across as self-righteous, which is interesting to me because to me that's almost the opposite because I choose to be vegan because I don't think I'm better than anyone else, including other animals. I think maybe at the underpinning what you're saying is, you mentioned dogs earlier and the relationship we have with them. If they were serving dogs for instance, in this restaurant, I suspect there'd be a bit of outrage and frustration. And I think if we take a second to think of that situation, that's probably a bit how some vegans may feel and that sometimes they don't communicate very well and they might vent versus advocate. I'm not justifying that behavior, but I'm just trying to maybe say one possible reason is that they're just so deeply disturbed by what's going on and they don't know what to do about it and they lash out. Um, but yeah, that's, but I, I don't know if that answers but your question. the same argument, Christians would be actually wonderful people. Well, quite. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a vegetarian, so yeah. Well, there you are. Mm -hmm. it, but he was deficient proof. Yeah. I believe the trees are conscious, are conscious and they communicate with each other through sort of networks. Mm. So plants are conscious. Yeah, there are lots of experiments done on plants where they've um, sort of sent loving thoughts and hated <laughs> each you tried and, and, and some have thrived and some haven't. So there is the if you're going to take it a step further, I'm not personally, but yeah. I do realise, I mean, I'm a gardener. Uh -huh. And, you know, some people cannot be around plants. You know, I'll give a friend a house plant, and I know it will be dead within a couple of weeks because <laughs> she just doesn't communicate with them. I mean, green yeah. fingers. So there is this, you can take it further. I would say the answer to that is even if we do believe that. Um, plants have feelings and experience life on a basic level the same way as us, we still kill a heck of a lot more plants when we filter them through other animals. So we still, <laughs> yes, yeah. there's cool things in nature that are worth trying to um, understand further. I mean, there's Venus flytraps growing towards the light, growing away from certain things. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Done with plants yeah. and trees. There's a lot of wonderful TED talk all about uh, how trees communicate and sometimes will support weaker trees which it just blew my mind, you know, this is scientific. I don't know how scientific or how valid it is, but I, yeah. know, I like to be challenged. Yeah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Anything, any other thoughts that we had? Any, yeah, go ahead. How much of a consensus is there in the vegan movement about sort of where you want to end up? Um, because I've, I've had the make the case, sort of a utilitarian case to me, that mm -hmm. you could make the moral argument that a small animal population that we look after in, in an intensive way or in the way you would a pet and sort of lavish them with the care and attention is morally better than um, lots of <coughs> free roaming animals living their own lives and possibly suffering more as a result. So, is there a consensus on? where you'd like animals to be ideally for So it sounds like your friend was making a case that if there's only a hundred animals in an intensive situation, that's better than a thousand that are in better but they're still being used? Okay, yeah. that's an interesting, actually I haven't really pondered that one myself, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. I think you hit on a big 
question, though, and it goes back to kind of the welfare versus rights perspective. In around the 1980s, actually that point in history, there's another um, philosopher I left out, Peter Singer. I imagine some of you have probably come across him, and that is the dominant um, ideology that has been absorbed by the movement, this utilitarian um, view that, um, and, and Singer himself actually identifies as a flexible vegan. And to me, that's a key point between um, saying no use is okay to let's reduce suffering. And I think that's a whole discussion in and of itself. But hopefully from this, this answer so far, you've, um, uh, I've answered that there's not a consensus. Yeah. There is some, some different alignment in that. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one, though. I mean, I think, um, it has, did anybody follow the Impossible Burger at all, in, uh, particularly in the US? That was a, um, what um, was later referred to as a plant-based burger. But in order for one of those ingredients to be released, they tested on 100, uh, 188 rats. Um, and they didn't need to do this, they just did it so that the product was more accessible. So from a utilitarian perspective, they say, all right, bugger these 188 rats, it's good for the greater good. From a rights-based perspective, they're saying, hang on, hang on, hang on, we shouldn't be using these rats. So that's where I think an example of, of where that draw, line's drawn, but hopefully we can all move towards uh, a, a similar conclusion in the end, but there are definitely some differences. Okay. Yeah. Does that kind of answer? Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a bit more than you. <laughs>
A lot of them are run by American companies. So. Mm. On the telephone, she spoke to you. Yes. Until Friday. Until Friday. Until Friday. Yes. Friday. Friday. <laughs> Take that control. <laughs> Yes. Well, I, th I think you raise a good point, that separation, because I know that for me, for the first 32 years of my life, there's definitely a separation, you know, when I ate someone's body, I wasn't thinking about it as someone's body, I was just thinking of the same thing. I mean, you until they die, them. Probably diseased, but I don't know. Yeah, disease maybe, don't you? You wait till they're dead. You've got to drive more dangerously, I suppose. If you get to know any animal, you know, like you're talking about pets, you can't, you wouldn't eat a, you wouldn't eat a pet. But you know, I've been in a situation where I've had to live a mosquito out of the bedroom window because I've got to know it. You know, I can't, I can't kill this. I think you're Can I ask a question about Rosie? Yeah. So, where else in the animal kingdom? Would Rosie put its head on another species? It's an interesting one to me because I actually struggle with that a lot. A lot of these stories I tell, they focus around my interactions with them. That's why I much prefer the turkey story of them wrapping the wing around their companion. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, probably not. It's probably not. I think to me it's a, it's a very, um, it's kind of like we mentioned dogs and cats. They're kind of caught between two worlds. You know, there are these animals that I think would naturally be free living. But they're indoors, then they go for walks, then back indoors. Sometimes they don't even go on walks. And I think to me, cows are in a similar situation. They're in these, hopefully, you know, they're in these vegan <coughs> sanctuaries. Short answer, I, didn't, I don't think they would. You know, I don't think there's a place for, you know, I don't want cows to exist so I can go around and have to suffer with them. I just want them to be there's there, there are lots of Facebook memes you do see of animals, species helping other species. True. Yeah. You know, of, 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 uh, mm. uh, elephants helping a wildebeest or a, yeah. a deer helping some ducks across the road. Which begs the question, do, do animals have moral agency? Which I think we kind of touched on through a few of these discussions. I mean, I saw a video clip where two cats were about to fight and a, a dog came over, picked one of the cats up by their collar and then carried them away and broke up the fight. I don't know how else you would set that and they realized there was something bad about to happen and separated them. I mean, I don't know. I think none of these are definitive answers, but I think they help to you know, certainly cast a question on it. But. There's, a, there's a program on, I think it's on the BBC, I've been watching it, it's, uh, it's, it's still on iPlayer, and it's uh, about chimps, and it's, 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 it's in Namibia, and this family went over there and uh, got into looking after rescued chimps. Uh, I really recommend you watching that, because it's absolutely fascinating, and because chimps are our closest um, uh, genetically. And uh, all this sort of stuff goes on, you're saying, and uh, yes, you can't look at a chimp the same way as you look at a, uh, you know, a rat or something. But it's, it's yeah, very you insightful. If you knew it, you knew the rat. Oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you get to know any animal. <laughs> well, which I think you raise a really good point because I know so many people. I think we have mutual friends that um, uh, uh, Louie and I um, that um, they went vegan after losing an animal companion because they formed that bond and they started to see them as someone versus something, which begs the question, is their moral value tied to our relationship to them or should they have moral value by themselves? Mm -hmm. I'll let you answer that question for yourselves, but. You yeah. mentioned chimps. Yeah. Um, when, when I was young, uh, we all thought chimps ate bananas um, or, you know, entirely vegetarian, but of course we now know that they hunt. Okay. Um, yeah. They yeah. hunt yeah. enthusiastically. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, think of, you know, uh, with great glee, yeah. they will hunt very clever monkeys. And they're our closest relationship. I think this relates to... Uh, no, you didn't ask a point of that. Uh, you asked about fox. Yeah. But, um, uh, so this, this, um, <coughs> assumption that we are innately empathetic towards other animals. Maybe um, has a dark side as well. There is a dark side to human nature where we actually enjoy killing mm. and eating. Yeah, and I, I, I don't reject that. I, there are people that I imagine do enjoy, they, they're quite happy to um, go hunting and kill the animals. No, 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 just yeah. people. Us. Just me, in general. You, you know, we all have it. 
Possibly in differing degrees, and possibly in a survival situation, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine taking pleasure from going home and offing my dogs, but... <laughs> no, no, um, but... Uh, Just as an example. Hunting, can you, can you not in business a situation where you are involved in a group excitement of a hunt and a kill? Can you, can you not imagine that? <coughs> in modern society, I would struggle to, if my survival depended on it, possibly. Mm. Possibly, I'll grant you that, yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no yeah. it's not survival, it's fun. Pleasure. Pleasure. Well, and that, that, that's another question, because we talk a lot about taste, and to me, I think there's a lot of, you know, I think we can see veganism as restricting our taste. To me, it's completely blown it up. I mean, my, I eat way more than I used to, and... <laughs> both, both I'm my, just wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think I think what you you, you say taps into the bigger question because I think we have two different things going on: pleasure and morality. To me, those are two different things. There's a lot of things I might enjoy doing. That doesn't necessarily mean it's moral to do them. So for me, for me, I'm heading towards veganism, and my whole family are because the meat industry pollutes more than every single form of transport. And that's that's the only moral imperative that we need to rapidly reduce our carbon. And um, meat is the easiest and quickest way of reducing carbon. Yeah, I don't know who um, that's on the the, um, the page linked the um, podcast before this talk, but because that had some interesting stats in it, um, namely that um, through veganism we reduce our carbon footprint um, diet related by seventy five percent. That's that's a stat I hadn't heard before. That that's quite Classic. obviously that's one part. But when we look at the day to day things, I mean, if we look at you know going to buy a Prius or these other things, actually just choosing what we choose to eat could actually be one of the biggest things that we can radically impact on a day to day basis. Because yeah. you said that people, well, someone said people are vegans for different reasons, and I think the environmental reasons are will, will persuade a great deal of people, mm -hmm. uh, even though they, they don't particularly go with animal rights. But who cares? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's the ultimate uh, aim in a way to reduce, uh, <coughs> reduce, uh, well, to improve the environment yeah. and improve well-being of the uh, first of humans, but also um, uh, animals. Yeah, because the environment ties back into animal rights too. Because none of us are going to have a planet on both us and other animals. But I mean, the way I take it is, if, if people want to do it from an environment or a health perspective, they tend to look into that for themselves. I think it's less likely that they'll pursue the you know animal rights perspective, so that's why I choose to focus on that. But you're right, I think there is definitely a compelling motivator there. Yeah. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Are, are vegans on the Home Office list of terrorist organizations? <laughs> <laughs> They're pushing for it. There is some legislation. So the question is, um, do you think um, that we should be? <laughs> Well, on, on a serious point, have you guys seen the new court ruling that is um, basically going to start provide protection against vegans, against discrimination in the workplace? Did anybody come across that yeah, yeah, yeah. article? Yeah. yeah, that's just in the last week or two. And yeah, so that's an interesting one. As it it's kind it's of a bit worrying as well because um, it means that uh, other it's a, the law may have to change for other groups. And I thought of inventing some crazy belief system or something. And, uh, and then just claiming, uh, and then taking it to court. But of course, it cost them a lot of money to go to court to actually claim their rights. Mm. Uh, but um, it's a bit worrying in a way from the other side. But it, a, good, a good outcome, but um, a bit worrying generally. But we are streets ahead in this country. And I, I travel all over the world for work. Mm -hmm. And this is the only country I go to where I can, apart from India, where I can walk into any restaurant and there'll be a vegetarian option. Mm. You know, the countries where I just, I literally take my own food, mm. or I just survive on nuts, bags of nuts, because I literally cannot eat anything in the restaurants at all. I agree, like, in terms of availability of food in different countries, the UK, even the supermarkets, is it's just so easy. So Everywhere you go in this country, yeah. There'll be, there be things to buy in terms of restaurants. Normally has like an option from this one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's very good. Well, it's, it's interesting. I think the, the, the key thing for me is the why versus the how. Once the why kind of resonates, the how for me at least kind of falls into place. I mean, talk about Mexican food. I grew up on Mexican food. I'm not even exaggerating, like several times a week. And, and I think once we start to think about these things from a different perspective, take away the cheese, 
even add some vegan cheese, but even if you don't do that, guacamole, salsa, some of the best flavors, refried beans, some of the best flavors in my opinion are vegan. So I think, yeah, and you can start to do these things that, you know, you can eat just about anywhere, I think. Yeah. Isn't one of the problems you're always up against economic vested interest? I can think of the slave trade. The slave trade was sustained because there were slave owners who relied on it economically. I would say the same is going to be with veganism. You've got the meat industry, which worldwide must be pretty big. Uh, you had it with the tobacco industry as well. So I mean, you're always going to have these sort of uh, economic arguments. Yeah. As opposed to moral arguments. I agree, that, yeah. That, that you're going to, or any of these things will, will compete against until it somehow it becomes. I mean, no one's going to advocate slavery again, I should think. Uh, well, slavery, I guess, still exists well, yeah. in certain forms, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not as an economic system, anyway. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting one, though, and it, I guess it begs the question can we liberate all of us yeah. under capitalism? Which I think is probably a different outside of the focus of this talk. But you're right, though, well, the financial why, I think that's why you become threats. Yeah. Because you're a threat to the, the established system. I've yeah. got uh, four Welsh great aunts who are a big threat because they, uh, in the 1930s, they ran a vegan guest house. 1930s? Oh. Yeah, in between the walls. Wow. Yeah, in, in North Wales, Diganwy. And they, there, was, there was a huge food movement between the walls. The hay diet, all these sorts of things came up between the walls. And they, uh, four Welsh, they all lost their fiancés in the First World War. They went off the rails slightly and uh, <laughs> all became complete vegans. Um, we dreaded going there on holiday because we literally got cress sandwiches <laughs> <laughs> and cold lentils and that was it. We had no idea how to cook. Is that a, I, is that a documented story? Like, that, has that, is, I've never, they're never ahead of the vegan society, they need some credit. Yeah, that was 1944. <laughs> so yeah. Wow. Yeah, 1933. I mean, pioneers, yeah. I think there are roots tracing back, it's just the formulation. Yeah. I mean, it is quite early days just from the movement perspective. We're only, what, 75 or so years into quite a radical social change. I mean, the gladiators and, and the fights they had in the Colosseum, that took, what, four to five hundred years to abolish that? So, I mean, these things, these things, they take a while when they're deeply ingrained. Yeah, that, that is going to take generations because, you know, um, I love cooking meat and animal products and uh, I've just become, just as a woman as vegan now, but, uh, I, I really miss, I, I, you know, all the skills of uh, cooking, say, um, French patisserie and uh, <coughs> lovely meat dishes and so on. Uh, I, I, I'm going to miss it. Uh, and, and although, although I, 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 I really knew how to cook lots of vegan food and vegetarian food, but, well, vegan food, we can't say vegetarian food, um, I, I definitely miss it. The, the range is diminished. Uh, but, um, and, and that's what you're up against. You're, you know, the meat tastes good, people have done it all the time. This guy here is a Jew, and so he starts off talking about um, uh, Thanksgiving and how important uh, their traditions are and so on. So it, it took him a long time to give up all that. But, uh, it's culture as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah the, the, the staple food of Shakespeare's time was the, the oyster and the mussel. And the, the Brits don't know what to do with that. Except for the France. Well, well, the Freud, yeah, until, until, until Friday. Friday. Until Friday, and then we can keep our own Well, I think it, it begs the question, because I think you, you raised some valid questions, like are we still going to be able to enjoy food, how are we going to make it? I mean, the one thing I'd say is anything you enjoy making, I challenge you to put into YouTube and say, and just put vegan in front of it, vegan blank blank recipe. Mm. It, I think you might be shocked. I think it might actually open up a whole new world, and well, we might actually enjoy food more. That's I've just, my experience. I've just joined UK just, Vegan Facebook. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they had uh, in the last uh, two weeks they had 900 new members. That's how fast this yeah. thing has grown. Wow. 900. <coughs> and the thing is, it's on those forums. It's almost too big because someone makes a post and there are like 300 replies in about. <laughs> uh, but uh, you're right. It's um, it's all being discussed on. Uh, there's, there's a lot of resources. Most of it's MI5. <laughs> 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 yeah, all the bots. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you really enjoy that, I think Challenge 22 might really be up your alley because they have around 200 people um, in uh, uh, each group that lasts about a month, and then you kind of interact on a more personal basis. What was that you said? Challenge 22. So if you go to, if you go to my if you go to my website, oh, it's like the main button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. um, that's a really good way to interact to kind of answer some of these questions. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 I eat a very, I'm not um, exaggerating, I ate a very bland diet before I went vegan, and now it's like 15, 20 ingredients, and yeah, it's, 
it's really blowing things up for me. I mean, I, I didn't know what goji berries were before I went vegan. I mean, that's just one example, but yeah. <laughs> there you go. That might be your new favorite food. You're missing out. Not very mild. What is the 22 then? What is the 22? Yeah, so the whole idea is that it's a 22 day challenge and it has to do with um, kind of shifting behavior change. But it's basically you just get put into a Facebook group and there's also emails if you prefer just to get that. Um, and they provide daily recipe ideas and, and they, they, I mean, it's called challenges because they give you daily challenges that you can do or not do, but it's kind of like, you know, cook a meal for a friend or, you know, go out to eat or try making a pizza or a pasta um, and that kind of thing. But the whole, and then they start to explore some of the other topics around veganism too. Um, but it's also quite useful for like, as a forum to discuss and support each other because sometimes like there's might be social situations which you're not used to mm. and you're maybe getting anxiety from like if it's a work still or something and you and you're the only mm. vegan potentially there and um, sometimes that can be a sort of challenge that mm. if people support each other yeah. they can overcome in fact half the posts on the uk <coughs> are about <coughs> the way people are reacting to it yeah mm. and what can i do about this so mm. it's <coughs> yeah issue. yeah to be honest i was introverted the first i mean i vegan six years the first half of that I was very introverted about it, and it wasn't until I really um, pursued the avenues of communication, and honestly, I don't really like public speaking, <laughs> but here I am. I think, to me, it kind of um, helps us to explore some of those things, because, yeah, the communication side of it and the social side of it is can be challenging at first, but I think once we get past that, we can get really confident, um, you know, talking about these things, and I think it's a lot of fun once we get to that place. But, but, but the joke about vegans, though, is that, um, how do you know someone's vegan if they tell you in the first 30 seconds you meet them? <laughs> it's, uh, and and, that, and that, that is true. <coughs> that is, that is there, there is something, yeah. there is something uh, evangelical. But, yeah. it's all, but if, if uh, there was no need to be vegan, then people wouldn't be saying no, I'm vegan. If, if animals weren't being used like, like they are, yeah. the vegan wouldn't need to say I'm vegan. Yeah. Well, I guess, I, I really like to do, when it comes to, I've mentioned a couple times, but the whole concept of speciesism and viewing them as less than just because of their species, I like to use the flip it to test approach. You know, someone was, was campaigning for women's rights and, oh, well, you know how you uh, meet a feminist, they tell you in the first 30 seconds. I don't know that it works so well with that one because it's a it's a just cause. So I just jump in like it's a just cause. I'm not trying to open up a whole other thing with that. So. <laughs> Let's go back to slavery. That's a good thing. I'm anti-slavery. So. Does it still exist? It does. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Get we're careful. Well, there are social workers there yeah. watching, profiling people. Yeah. Yeah. Comes in. It's right. Mm. Well, I think the, the, back to the point of capitalism. As long as there's that profit incentive, there's people that are, you know, circumvent both legal and moral um, yeah. you know, rights. Is there anything else anyone would, would like to add to the discussion? Um, I can't remember. Sorry, I can't remember your name. You, you were talking about um, Steve. Police dogs. Or Steve, that's right. Mm -hmm. Talking about police dogs or something with Jeremy. Yeah, we were saying about police dogs. Um, and like guide dogs and that sort of thing and uh, we sort of saying how difficult it is on the uh, moral front mm. to decide, yeah. <coughs> is there a moral issue there? Yeah, like teaching your dog to do something, you know, it's very, uh, people that are humans are putting themselves on their dogs, aren't they, by making them do something. Mm. Or, like riding a horse. or riding a horse. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, do, do, do vegans ride horses? So there are a lot of conflict dogs in horseback riding. Uh, the, 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 the blanket answer is that veganism does not support animal use. Some people interpret that different than others. I would interpret that um, to not be using them. I mean, I think we've got a couple different examples if we focus in on horseback riding. Before I volunteered at Friend for about two years, I volunteered at another sanctuary that cared for about 40 equine. Every single one of them had back issues and feet issues from having been ridden. So my question is, you know, why would we do that if we don't have to? Why not just walk along the side of them, have that same bonding experience? And not force that on them, but this, this to me, this is something that if we can get to the the focus of veganism, let's focus on that. This the entire scope of veganism has a lot of complex topics, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, that helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
guide dogs. Yeah. Real quickly, I mean, I think we talked also about, I watched a movie recently about dogs who were used in war. And again, horses. Uh, yeah. Mining, uh, I think they're the worst things in the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think dogs like to please humans. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the big question if they're um, here with us or for us, and maybe a more simple question, possibly more practicable, is um, should we be breeding dogs into existence for our entertainment? Or should we be rescuing dogs who need a home that would be killed otherwise? <clears throat> you don't need to breed them exactly. for that because yeah. they usually pick the biddable ones that come rushing up and want to do things with the human mm. and they see a lot of the jobs like picking things up as a game. Yeah. Whereas perhaps the wife or husband will get jolly cut up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're using the relationship and the skills very well in that situation. Well, and I think a lot of these animals are caught between two worlds. I mean, we talked a bit about ex-battery hens and the experience there, and, and I think we do the best that we can with them in the situation that they are. You know, that's what our rescue dogs at home are doing. I'd prefer not to have them in a the house right now. I'd prefer them to, you know, be out exploring, you know? But they're in a the house. Is that natural? Is that fair? You know, you do the best to balance these situations, I think. Yeah. But there's a general argument about domestication, though, is that they... Uh, that, uh, if there's a particular farmer in here, he's one of the few farmers in America, well, one of the few farmers left in America, and he has his, uh, <coughs> and he doesn't have any, he can leave the gates open because the animals don't want to go. Because it's, and he's saying uh, that the reason domestication took place was a kind of compact between formerly wild animals. They know they're better off um, in the protection of humans, and humans exploit them as well. So it's a kind of, almost like a compact. Of course, they're not aware of it. Uh, but um, by their behaviour, you might in in induce that, uh, deduce that. But um, it's a pretty weak argument. But it's uh, <laughs> it uh, it just shows that animals, you know, can be quite happy with people, and they get mm. something from them, mm. and we get something from them. Oh, and I like to think that the animals at friend that I um, uh, uh, go out to visit occasionally, I like to think that they're getting the best life that they can given the situation that they're in. You know, Rosie, who lived 21 years, I mean, she was um, destined to be a beef cattle, which is actually one of the longest living animals. They lived to about two years. Most animals, it's, you know, pigs, it's what, six, six months? Six months. Kentucky mm. fried chicken, 39 days. <coughs> <coughs> and um, male chicks in the egg industry, 24 to 48 hours, yeah. if that. Mm. So, that's an incredibly somber note to end this yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I guess if I, if I just had some closing thoughts, is there any other thoughts before, that you'd like to get out there before? Um, I would just say that um, I think we talked a lot about some of the kind of limitations and barriers, and I would just say my personal experience is that veganism has been an absolute joy, so I encourage you to, to continue to explore it for yourself. So th thank you all, honestly, for the invite. Now, I've been vegan for about six years. In fact, my vegan anniversary is on the 24th of February, so it may have already happened by the time this video comes out. Vegan for six years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vegan for six years, this is only the start. Now, in the last three years since I started campaigning for animal rights on a more full-time basis, I've never done anything like this, but it was so much fun, and I heard so many questions I've never heard before. This to me just shows that when we follow our passion, we never know where it might take us. And I can't wait to explore this area of my advocacy further, and I actually have a talk booked in at a Skeptics in the Pub group uh, for next month. Now one really cool part about this is I actually got feedback from the group shortly after I did the talk. And I think as animal advocates, we can often say things, but we're not necessarily sure how they're interpreted. And this was a rare glimpse of what another person was thinking as they were listening to my message. The really cool thing about this is they seem to take on board the difference between welfare and animal rights, which is, I think is a really key distinction for us all to make. This was such a great experience, and if you enjoyed watching this, you might like to look into your local area for skeptics in the pub or humanists or other similar groups who might be interested in having in a speaker to discuss veganism and animal rights. Now, if you enjoyed this more long-form discussion, please let me know in the comments because I'm always evaluating where I dedicate my time, and if I know people are enjoying watching these things, I'll keep doing them.
Another cool element to this event that I wasn't expecting is it actually got local coverage in the newspaper. Now while I've done uh, some mainstream media appearances, especially on the radio in the past, I've never had one of my specific events covered in the newspaper before, so this is pretty exciting. So there you have it, there's the full Q&A. I really look forward to doing more of these in the future and have another one booked actually in a couple of weeks. But before that, I'm really excited to get my new language video, which I've been itching to get out for probably um, close to a year and a half. Do you want to miss out on how we can use our words to evolve our advocacy? I didn't think so. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. See you in the next video. The dog has a brain and a central nervous system. The plant does not. If I had both here... <laughs> I was not brought here for my dancing, so that's not going to be anything. <laughs> Thanks for watching and for free support for new vegans and free resources such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com.